Hello everybody, my name is Jay. I'm one of the expert PTE academic teachers here at E2 Language. Thanks for coming along. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, what I suggest you do is, well, you can watch this on YouTube, that's fine. But in future, if you really do wanna have a, a better preparation experience, come across to e2language.com and sign up for free. Uh, you'll get access to some live classes, You'll get access to some practice questions and methodology lessons, et cetera. But really, if you want to crack the PTE, you should think about upgrading your account on e2language.com and potentially even taking our mini mock test with feedback as a starting point. It's an excellent starting point because it's going to provide you with all of the details of where you sit in the grand scheme of things and what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and what you need to do to improve to get the score you want. And you should also subscribe if you're on YouTube. Okie dokie. So what we're going to do in this live class is focus on writing. Uh, last week we did speaking. So this week writing, next week we'll be reading. Now with PT Academic, uh, in the writing section, there are only two tasks. There's summarize written text and write essay. But actually there are a number of tasks that contribute points to your writing score. They include summarize spoken text, reading and writing fill in the blanks, fill in the blanks and write from dictation. And these other tasks come from the listening or reading sections. Okay, so they will also contribute points to your writing score. So we're going to look at all of these in this lesson. Let's start from the bottom up though. And we're gonna start with what I think is probably a key task actually. It seems to have quite a strong impact on your score for both writing and listening. And it's in the listening section. It's the final task of the listening section. In fact, it's the final task of the entire exam. And it's called write from dictation. And on test day, you're gonna get three or four of these. Um, it has, as I mentioned, integrated scoring. It's contributing points to listening and writing at the same time. This is what it looks like on test day. What's going to happen is, wait, is that written here? Okay, what's going to happen is you're going to hear a single sentence and you'll then write that single sentence, then you're gonna click next, pretty straightforward. So you listen, you write, you check, and then you click next, okay? Let's talk about the scoring for this particular task. So you will be penalized on a number of different things. So what you need to do is spell the words correctly, don't leave any words out, and don't replace any words. So you write down the exact sentence that was said in the same, uh, uh, in the exact same way, okay? For the exact same vocabulary, exact same grammar, in which case you'll get 100%. If you spell a word wrong, you'll be penalized, but you don't just get a zero or 100%, you get a partial mark. So let's say there are 10 words, you miss one of the words, you'll get 90%. If that includes, by the way, misspellings or, or if, if the word is students and you write student, or if the word is student and you write students, that will be considered incorrect as well. Even though it's sort of a grammatical issue, you could think of it like a spelling issue if you like, you'll lose a point there. Don't leave out any words. So don't leave it if the sentence is the student experience is at the heart of everything we do and you forget the word student, then you're going to lose a point there. Uh, and don't replace any words. That means if the word that they say is experience, but you write the word experiment, that would be considered incorrect as well. So make sure you don't do any of that. And I'm gonna skip. Here's a, here's a little thing. Nobody's been able to confirm this for certain, but there's nothing mentioned in the scoring about sequence of words. Okay, so if you, if you write, if the sequence is student experience and you write the experienced student, I'm gonna say that it may be correct. Okay, anyway, try to write down the same, the correct sequence anyway, but if you can't remember what the sequence is, just write it down anyway. Okay, so how do we approach this particular task on test day? Well, if we think about our minds and how our minds work, there are different parts of our minds. And one of the parts is called memory. And there are different types of memory. There's short term, there's long term memory. And within short term memory, we have uh, what's called working memory, which is very um, instantaneous sort of memory. It just lasts for like a few seconds. So there's part of your memory is part of the right from dictation will be using or utilizing your working memory because you do need to keep something in your mind for a few seconds. You hear the sentence, you keep it in your working memory while you're writing it down 
and then I'm sure you won't remember it after the test. The problem with working memory is it holds only about five things at once max, okay? So what we need to do is, um, and if the sentence has 10 words, that's problematic. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. What we need to do is we need to think about the sentence or we need to pay attention to or comprehend or understand that sentence, not as individual words. We need to understand that sentence when it comes into our minds as chunks or phrases. That's what we do with language anyway. We don't actually pass or comprehend language word by word. What we do as funny humans is we understand phrases or chunks of language, which might include, you know, two, three, four, five words at once. That's how we sort of um, comprehend language. So the student experience, there's the subject, is at the heart of everything we do. That's how uh, my mind would process or pass this sentence. The student experience is at the heart of everything we do. So I'm not memorizing 10 individual words, I'm memorizing three phrases. So you should be listening for, listening to those phrases or chunks, we can call them chunks. So the method is this, you listen for chunks, then you write down the chunks, you check the grammar and spelling, and then you click next. Let's do a few, let me disappear. Sorry, I've lost my mouse cursor. Ah, Microsoft PowerPoint, come on. Okay, I've truly lost my mouse cursor. It is in here somewhere. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, there it is, holy moly, it's just, whoa, whoa, that's cool. I don't know what that does. Sorry about that, I found my mouse cursor. Terrific news, we can continue on. I hope it doesn't disappear again. Okay, let me disappear. And you're going to listen to a sentence in three, two, one. Our annual reports record our strategic direction. Now write it down. Oops, I'll give you some time. Okay. Our annual Hopefully you wrote down this. Our annual reports record our strategic direction. I would sort of hear this or see this as really two or three chunks, certainly our annual reports. I mean, that's really focusing around that noun reports, but we've got the adjective annual reports, the collocation, our annual reports. Then we've got the verb there, record. Then we've got another phrase there, our strategic direction. Um, just type into the chat what you got there. How did you go with that sentence there? Yeah, ah, chemistry of biomass conversion. There you go, crazy stuff, good stuff. Okay, somebody wrote, our now annual reports have been strategic temperature. <laughs> Omid says, um, Omid says, plurals are such a, a killer. Yeah, reports, interesting. Our annual report, you, see the thing is, if it was report, our annual report records, there would be an S on the verb. Reports, record. Good, okay. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Cool, all right, let's do another one. I want you to really relax this time. Let's try something a little bit uh, meditative, shall we? Let's do something with our minds. What I want you to do is, when you're listening to this next sentence, I want you to relax. And I want you to absorb the sentence, not in your mind, not with your attention, but with your greater awareness, okay? So if you relax your attention and just really listen and let the sentence absorb into your greater field of awareness, let's see what happens. Okay, 
three, two, just relax, one. Some organizations and government agencies provide funding to students. All right, you can type your sentence into the chat there. That was a pretty tricky one. All right. All right, all right. Let's do some more. Here are the answers. So, some now spelling. Here you can use American or British, it doesn't matter, Z or S. Some organizations and government agencies, see, that was a trick, really, because some organizations, phrase, and government agencies, phrase, provide, there's your verb, provide, funding to students. So that's what made this hard, is the subject almost had two, two things, organizations and agencies. How did you go there? What do you reckon you're, how did you go, how did you go? Yeah, so Mingling forgot agencies, but that's okay. Doesn't matter. So, okay, quite a few people forgot the government agencies part. Somebody added the ex an extra word, the. Ravi got it all right. Nice work, Ravi. Good stuff. Cool. All right, let's uh, keep going. Oh, now we're going to continue on. Okay. Let's chat now about uh, the next one. Actually, do you have any questions about write from dictation? Please pop them into the chat. Any questions about write from dictation? Any questions about write from dictation? Is there a penalty for adding extra words? Um, not according to the official score, um, the, the PTE score guide. But just be careful. I think there probably is, but it's, it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult to find out the answer to these sorts of questions with high stakes tests. They sort of keep that information a little bit secret. Um, Naomi asks, do we have negative marking for this? Uh, well, what, what you have is what's called partial marking, which means like, for example, you have 10 words in that sentence, you get eight of the words, so you get 80%. Um, the, quest, the, the question that I actually don't know the answer to, and I can't find out the answer, unfortunately, I've actually spoken to Pearson about this at length, is whether you add a word uh, that's not in that sentence, will you be penalized for it? And the answer is, I don't know, but just try not to do it, I guess is the short answer there. Um, Janitor says, like, how many words are typically in a, in a sentence? Uh, is there a limit? Yes, of course, there is a limit, definitely. Typically, the words, the sentence length will be about sort of 10 to 12 words, okay? So in those 10 to 12 words, we're talking sort of uh, three phrases of sort of three or four words. Manish says, sometimes the, ver the voice uh, occurs very quickly. Yes, you have to be really alert, but I think alert, but relaxed, not distracted by a thought or not distracted by somebody coughing over here. You really have to be focused in. It's, a, it's yeah, we're talking split seconds here. Okay, let's push on and look at the next one, which is from the reading section of the PT academic. However, it does contribute points to your writing score as well. So you're gonna get five or six of these particular question types on test day. Um, score, it gives you points to reading and writing, and you'll be spending about less than three minutes per question. This is what reading and writing fill in the blanks um, looks like on test day. So you have your text, I think it's up to 300 words long. 
you have these drop down lists that will have four answer options. Um, and you have about four or five of these in the text. Now, usually um, the answer option is going to get you to select a correct answer from a bunch of synonyms. So let's say the synonyms are, uh, let's say the, the, the word is hot, okay? Like an adjective like hot. And then we have, oh God, I can't think of other adjectives for hot. Um, okay, I need another one. <laughs> tall, let's say tall. And let's say that the other adjectives are high, tall, large, something like that, okay? But they're sort of related words, related words relating to size, okay? But only one of them is going to be correct in the context of this sentence and in the context of the paragraph, okay? So you'd be selecting based on meaning. Really what this is testing for is what's called word choice. And this is why it relates to your writing score because word choice is your ability to select the right word at the right time to make the right meaning. Now, um, here's a good example. So the four options might be smart, scholarly, clever and intellectual, all relating to a, a similar theme there, but scholarly might be the correct one based on the context. Then you also have uh, questions that will test you on grammar. So there'll be three ungrammatical words and one will be grammatical. For example, scholar, scholarly, school and scholastic. So you'll have to select the adverb here because in this sentence, it's the adverb that makes uh, grammatical sense. Um, next one will be collocation or a, a short phrase. Like you might have a verb here like take, and then you have to, you have to choose a word to complete this phrase. Like, do you take duty, take responsibility, take authority or take task? Well, you take responsibility for your life, for example. So maybe that's the, the phrase or the collocation. Next one is just based on context alone. So this word will be correct because something further in the text says mentions it or something prior in the text mentions it, okay? So let's think about how we do this with meaning, grammar, collocation, and context. We'll focus on meaning first. With regard to meaning, we're talking about synonyms, okay? So here's a word like messy and we have all of these synonyms or similar words in English, dirty, filthy, grubby, soiled, grimy, grime, mucky, muddy, slimy, sticky, sullied, spot, all of these words relate in some way to messy. However, they are only used in a certain context. So here we'd have an extremely something personal space leads people to believe the owner of that space is more neurotic. Just give you 10 seconds here, which is the correct one. We're talking about this noun space here or personal space. What, uh, what word do we use when we're talking about somebody's room or space? Correct, everyone's got it, messy, well done. So the answer there is messy, an extremely messy personal space. Soiled is wrong. Soiled is, I went and saw my niece and nephew yesterday for the first time in, wow, like six months because Melbourne's been in this lockdown and now we're allowed out. So I went and visited my little niece and nephew and my, my nephew is two years old. And I mean, he soils his nappy. So that's what soiled means there. Um, so if this was a, a paragraph about babies, you might be using the, the soiled adjective there. And tarnished and smeared have different, um, different meanings as well. Okay. So grammar, next one is grammar. So psychologists explored the degree of something in one's workspace and how it affects perceptions of the owner's personality. Which of these words is the correct grammar for this sentence? Good, nice, 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 nice. Good, and you can get a sense for why this is contributing points to your writing score because word choice is so critical, right? Messiness, degree of messiness. We need the noun form here, okay? You can't have a degree of messy, degree of messily, degree of messed up. No, we need ness on the end to make the noun. Excuse me, okay. If you need help with grammar, if you found that confusing or you were just like, you know, not 
on why the answer is the way it is, check out this website called e2school.com. And there's a course on there for free. And I'm one of the teachers and it's a grammar review course. And so we go through adjectives, nouns, all the different verb tenses, prepositions, etc., And we look at all of these and you're doing lots of activities while you're doing that course, okay? So it's e2school.com. Collocation is the next one. In three experiments, about 160 participants were randomly what? To sit in a researcher's office that was clean and uncluttered. Try to guess this randomly. What's the answer here? Just without me showing you the options, what do you think the answer is? Randomly assigned, randomly selected, randomly chosen. Correct, good. These are good uh, phrases or collocations to, to look at. So what do you think the answer is now? This is a, a sciencey question. So for those of you doing PhDs, I'm sure you're talking about random assignment or the randomly assigned, or you can be randomly selected, randomly chosen. These are phrases, collocations, okay? Um, also, if you wanna build vocabulary skills, okay, maybe your vocab is bringing you down in this test. Again, check out e2school.com. And we've got this course on there called Test Ready, and it's about building academic vocabulary. And it, it, yeah, it's really good, really good. Context. Um, I'm actually gonna skip this one. I'm gonna skip that one because um, we've got a lot to get through. But what I suggest you do is um, spend some time in the practice questions on e2language.com and when you're doing them, just sort of think to yourself, okay, is this asking, asking me about meaning? Is it asking me about grammar? Is it asking me about collocation or fra natural phrases? Or is it asking me to select an answer based on overall context? Um, all of these things will help you once you start to sort of clarify what these mean when you go to actually write, okay? So when you're writing your essay. Okay, any questions about reading and writing fill in the blanks? Okay, great question from Omid, which is a very um, obvious question. What if we don't know the meaning of the word? Then you have to guess. You have to guess and you've got a 25% chance of getting it right. Cool, okay, must be clear. Okay, this is the first task we're talking about today where you actually uh, put pen to paper, so to speak, and actually do some writing. It's called summarize spoken text. You're gonna get two or three on test day. You'll have to write a summary of a lecture or interview that'll be uh, between 50 and 70 words. You'll have 10 minutes to write it and it's going to contribute points to your listening and writing score. This is what it looks like on test day. So you're gonna hear a lecture. You're gonna to need to take notes on your erasable noteboard booklet thing. Then you're going to write up your summary, okay? You're scored on various parameters. You're scored on content, that is you write on topic. You're scored on length, that is you write between 50 and 70 words. You're scored on grammar, that is your sentences, are, well, you know, plural nouns, articles, the correct preposition, etc. You're scored on vocabulary, your word choice, again, word choice, what we talked about before, that is you're choosing the right word at the right time to make the right meaning, the right collocation, the right phrase, um, et cetera, and spelling as well. So there's different parts to this task. So this is the first task in listening. So while you're listening to this lecture or this interview, you will need to take notes, okay? You'll be jotting down keywords, key phrases that you hear. And your handwriting is going to be really messy, but it doesn't matter because what your notes are doing is they're helping you to two things they're doing. One is while you're listening, as you're writing, it's helping you to concentrate on the listening aspect. Um, okay, so the, the note taking should help you to really listen because you're going to be writing down key words. But then the notes become like a, a, your memory. They become an... Um, What's the word here? 
the word is artifact. Anyway, you're going to, you want not just relying on your mental memory, you'll be using that, but you're going to have all these keywords written down on the page in front of you. Then when you write your summary, you're going to be using your memory, using your notes and writing the summary. And there's a certain structure that you should use for your summarized spoken text. The speaker was discussing the topic, biochemistry. What did you, what was your thing, Ivan? Um, I can't remember, something about biochemistry. He mentioned blah, 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 blah. He talked about blah, 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 blah. He discussed this and he suggested that or he concluded that blah, 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 blah. Of course, you can expand upon this. This is just a basic framework. You can add, you can change the verbs. He, 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 um, I can't think of one. He compared, for example, that's fine. You can use that if you want. You can add in addition to blah, blah, blah. You can combine them into two sentences. It's up to you. Here's some other verbs. He highlighted, described, thought, seemed, contrasted, compared, believed, etc. So feel free to change the verbs. But really these X's become your keywords. And for the conclusion, he suggested that or he concluded by saying da, 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 da. Okay. So here's an example one. Um, I'm going to skip it though, because we're going to do, we're going to do one in a second. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube and you've got a PT academic test coming up, do think about signing up to E2 language to take our mini mock test with feedback. It's well, I'm going to say this, there's the official mock test, which gives you a score and a score only, or there's our mock test, which gives you a score and feedback on your writing, including uh, three tasks, write essay, summarize spoken text, summarize written text, and feedback, teacher feedback on your speaking, read aloud, repeat sentence, uh, describe image and summarize, no, and retell lectures. Anyway, lots and lots of feedback there. So it's really good. You can focus in on weak areas to know what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. All right, let's do a bit of practice now. So please listen carefully and take notes. So right now in 2018, it's all about Bitcoin, right? You've probably already been hoodwinked. But in the past, we've had dot-com stocks, uh, the 1929 crash, the... Uh, 19th century railways and the South Sea bubble of um, 1720. All these were compared by contemporaries to, uh, to tulip mania. Have you heard of this? It's the Dutch financial craze for tulip bulbs in the 1630s. Bitcoin, according to some skeptics, is tulip mania 2.0. Like all bubbles, uh, tulip mania was irrational, the story goes. Tulip mania was uh, a frenzy. Everyone in the Netherlands was involved from chimney sweeps to aristocrats. The same tulip bulb, or rather tulip future, was traded sometimes 10 times a day. No one wanted the bulbs, only the profits. It was a bit of a phenomenon of pure greed. Tulips were sold for crazy prices, in some cases the price of houses, and fortunes were won and lost. Pretty crazy stuff. It was the foolishness of newcomers to the market that set off the crash in um, February 1637. Desperate bankrupts threw themselves in canals. The government finally stepped in and ceased the trade, but not before the economy of Holland was ruined. So it makes an exciting story. The trouble is, most of it is untrue. Okay, how did you go with your key words there? Um, you'll now have about, on test day, you'll have about nine minutes left. How long was this audio? I think it was, there you go, a minute 20. So you can have eight minutes and 40 seconds to, to now write your, your summary. So you'll be writing your summary into here and it should be between 50 and 70 words. Um, now, um, let's do a little vote of democracy considering that's been a hot topic in the last few days with the Trump Biden thing. Uh, do you want to write a summary now or do you want to skip it? Please say yes or no. Yes, if you want to write the summary or no, if you want to skip it. Okay, Ooh, it's neck and neck. We got Michigan, we got different states voting in. Um, <laughs> it's about, sorry, I asked, it's about split 50%. Let's do it really quickly. Let's just bang out a summary, okay? It doesn't need to be 50 or 70 words, but this is good practice. Let's just do it in say, uh, I'll give you three minutes 
to just crank out a summary, please. And then we'll look at a high scoring one. Your three minutes starts. Usually you'll have eight minutes and 40 seconds. I'm giving you three minutes starting now. A minute and a half left. One minute left. Okay, these will be the quickest summaries written in history. Holy moly, people. <laughs> good. Doesn't matter, it's good practice. Great, nice, looking pretty strong. It's amazing how, um, how much easier it makes it when you have a, a structure in mind like if you're sort of thinking, if you're trying to create the structure yourself, that's a real problem. If you're going in there knowing the speaker was discussing, but he discussed, mentioned, described, compared, believe, whatever, duck, 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 duck. that's your basic framework. It's the same thing for the essay. You'll find that having a basic structure for your essay, oh my God, you know, it just makes the whole thing much more efficient on test day, especially on test day, because you know, one of, the, one of the things that can happen on test days, you can sort of, if you're getting a bit anxious, you can sort of have a bit of brain freeze. You don't want brain freeze on test day. You want to be as clear as possible. And these structures will help you with that. Okay, cool. All right. Here is a high scoring example. Speaker was discussing an economic bubble in the 17th century called tulip mania that happened in Holland. He compared tulip mania to today's Bitcoin bubble and suggested the two events are similar. He described how people in Holland became obsessed with buying and selling tulip bulbs, some of which were incredibly expensive. Finally, he concluded that, in fact, the story of tulip mania was largely untrue. That's a good um, summary in terms of content. That's a good summary in terms of grammar, vocabulary, spelling, and structure as well. If you do require some feedback on your writing, then uh, 
our packages, our higher packages come with speaking and writing feedback, or you can purchase one-off speaking and writing feedbacks. Um, or if you need extra help, um, like you're really struggling with writing or speaking, for example, you can book one-on-one -on -one tutorials with the expert teacher, 45 minutes one-on-one, -on -one, where you'll be doing uh, practice questions and they'll be um, commenting or really helping you to find out what's going on. Okay, let's look at summarize written text. This is really the first real uh, writing task on test day. So you'll get one or two. Um, it'll contribute points to writing and reading. You're scored on content, length, grammar, and vocabulary. This is what it looks like on test day. You'll see, uh, in fact, it'll be a much larger text than this. This is a, a, a very much a shrunken text. You'll see quite a large text. What you need to do is to turn that text into a single sentence, a one sentence summary, not two sentences, not five, a single sentence summary. And so how you're going to divide up your 10 minutes is like this. You're gonna read for about three or four minutes to so you fully understand what the text is about. You're gonna spend about five or six minutes writing and rewriting your sentence. Then you're gonna spend one or two minutes checking your sentence just to make sure it's perfect, okay? With reading or when you're reading, you need to find out the main idea of the whole text and uh, one or two, one, two or three important sub ideas. So you're gonna ignore a lot of text, okay? You're really boiling it down to find the most important aspect or aspects. Or if the text is split into paragraphs, you'll find the idea of the main idea of each paragraph and stitch them together into a sentence. When you're writing, you'll need to play with the sentence. You'll need to move the sentence parts around. You'll need to make the sentence complex. That is, you'll need a which, that, or who word in there to make it technically a complex sentence. Try to avoid words like however and therefore because they usually create what's called a run-on sentence. Having a word like although or despite at the start of the sentence is fine. One of those sentences that is like although, da, 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 or despite, da, 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 da. And you should be aiming for a total word count of your single sentence between 30 and 40 words. Um, what am I doing here? Oh, yeah, what I find on test day is, or what I find when I do this is, the first sentence you write is very rarely a very good sentence. You sort of write the first one and go, oh, that's not right. Let me move that part to the beginning. Let me move that here. Let me delete that. Let me add this. You know, you'd be sort of rearranging or playing with the sentences quite a bit. Uh, just some final tips for this task. You can use single words or maybe even short phrases of one or two, possibly three words from the text. Some words you can't find a synonym for. If the word, for example, is diamond, like let's say the text is about diamonds, what's a synonym for the word diamond? Hard, shiny stone? No, you have to word, use the word diamond. So you can, you can use single words from the text. Try to use synonyms and paraphrase where possible and try not to push two sentences together. Okay, let's do some practice now. I'm just going to give you three minutes to read this turn away from the text, write it into a single sentence summary.
All right. Obviously, that was a very short amount of. Oh, Ganesh, that is a really good sentence. Well done. I'm going to read Ganesh's sentence because that is spot on. The University of New Mexico has published a study that suggested that holding a pen between the teeth generates positive emotions for people who suffer anxiety and depression, as well as those who witness people doing the action. Right, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Spot on. That's a ripper sentence. That is uh, grammatically perfect. It's a complex sentence, captures the main idea, the supporting sub ideas. Um, Nice. Nice. Ravi's is good too. There's some really good sentences coming in here. Nice. Sakshi's is, is good too. So well done. There's some really good sentences coming in. So this is my sentence. It's, it's quite brief, um, but this is sufficient. Holding a pen in between your teeth, like that, actually it kind of does make you a bit happy. Holding a pen in between your teeth to induce a fake smile can make both. <laughs> Did it work for you? It kind of worked for me. Uh, can make both you and the person watching you happier. Okay, hopefully that was the case then. Um, cool. Anyway, that's a, a good example there. Uh, nice. So, so Omid's got a good question here, which is, instead of using the word anxiety or depression, can I use a, a paraphrase or a synonym like mental disorder? To be honest, I, it makes it a little bit less precise. I would actually use those words, um, anxiety and depression, because they're very precise words and they don't really have a, they don't really have a good synonym. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, you will need to make that decision on test day. Just make sure if you're using a synonym that it's, um, it's still capturing the same meaning. Cool. Okay, I've talked enough about that. Okay, the, the, the final part here is write essay. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna direct you really to this video because there's not enough time in this class to go into the, the details of um, write essay. But what I will tell you is that the structure that we teach in that methods lesson um, is critical. Um, I can also tell you that the, your writing score really depends largely on your essay or your essays, you might have to write two. And I really think that this structure really helps boost your score. It doesn't help your grammar, it doesn't help your vocabulary, but what it does is it makes your, it, it makes it far quicker to write the essay because you have a skeleton to work with. And as a result, you can then think more clearly, more carefully about the grammar that you use, the vocabulary, etc. So. I really highly recommend that you watch this. You learn that structure for test day. It's not a template. That means it's not just a gap fill thing, a memorized template. It's, it's flexible. It allows you to answer any essay question on test day. Um, however, it does provide that sort of backbone, that structure, which is good. Richard, are you going to run a class for reading? Uh, yes, in fact, that'll be next, not next week, the week after Richard. Sakshi, I ran out of time in my essay and then I got a second essay, which I was not prepared for. Any idea if this happened because of the time or generally also we get two essays? Um, okay, so how it works in PT is there's different uh, variations in the pattern on, for writing. Some people will get two summarized written text, one essay. Some people will get two summarized written text, two essays. Some people get one summarized written text, two it's different patterns. Here's the uh, thing that'll, um, I don't know if it'll annoy you, but here's some interesting information. If you get two essays, only one of them is going to be scored, but you don't know which one. They're using the other essay to train the computer algorithm, okay? So, the, you don't know if it's the first one or the second one. So you need to work hard on both essays. But yeah, Ivan says two essays is a nightmare. Richard says that's unfair. Mingling says no. This is what all computer-based tests do, by the way. They they put in these they these test 
questions, these test items. They need to train the scoring algorithm. So they need lots of data. So you're the guinea pigs, I'm afraid, um, while you're doing this. But it's okay. Just, I mean, it's 20 minutes. Um, the structure really helps. If you've done the prep, if you've get, gotten some writing feedback, it, it should make it, um, uh, it should be fine. Richard says, the time, yes, the time will be adjusted if you get two essays. You get 20 minutes for the first one, 20 minutes for the second one, okay? So it's not unfair in that, in that sense. Yes, Ivan says, we have been assigned for experiments. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, here's a good question. Mehenaz, in, on YouTube, there's a specific person who says that if you use the backspace key, it will, it will reduce your points in the writing section. Is that true? No, it's just not true. I don't think that person's lying. I don't think they're doing it to lie on purpose. I think they're just misguided, very misguided. So that's wrong. It's incorrect feedback. You can use the backspace key. <laughs> they, have, they have other ways of assessing how you, if your writing's good or bad, and it's not whether you use the backspace key. It's really not true. Please don't, please don't believe that. Um, I looked into the algorithm, how it's, how it works. And it's based on, it's based on principles of language. It's based on grammar. It's based on vocabulary. It's based on collocation. It's based on structure. So really it is actually assessing your ability to write, not your ability to not use the backspace key. Ganesh, they would have removed the key on the keyboard boards if it was prohibited. Yeah. I mean, it's just, a, it's just a crazy, Oh, I mean, here's the, here's the thing that disproves it is um, I took up, uh, look, heaps of people from E2 language, tens of thousands have, have, have prepared with us. Uh, thousands of people, maybe more, have gotten perfect scores for writing. I would say all of them use the backspace key. So how do you get a perfect score for writing if the backspace, backspace key reduces your score. It doesn't make any sense. I, I took the PT, I got a perfect score. I use the backspace key lots. Anyway, it's a good myth, that one. Whoa, what's happening here? I think my, uh, sorry, just lost my, lost my PowerPoint. Um, Oh, cool. Okay, that was the end. That was the end. That was the end. If you have any questions, please pop them into the chat. Any more questions? Mingling, are we going to use a computer or a laptop in the real test? You use a computer and it's you have your own little workstation. There's sort of the petitioned up, so you can't really see the other person. You can't see the other person's screen. You can see them. Um, yeah, so you'll be in your own little booth. It's a little bit distracting on test day, when, especially in the speaking, when everybody starts to speak, you have to really concentrate in. But other than that, it's, it's quite a pleasant experience. Omid, how important is spelling in the writing score? Um, I don't know exactly, Omid, but having looked at hundreds and hundreds of people's report cards, including my own, um, if they received a, a low spelling score, you still can get a perfect writing score. So spelling only affects writing, right? Spelling doesn't affect speaking or reading or listening. And you can get a low spelling score and get a perfect writing score. So going from that, we can assume that spelling is not worth many points, okay? Thank you, Ravi, appreciate it. Richard, do you have any ideas when the borders will open? No, I, no, I don't know, I don't know. So it's a crazy world we live in. Sakshi, do we need to use good vocabulary and complex words in the essay or simple sentences are good too? A, a bit of a mixture, Sakshi. You can use a particular vocabulary word, a particular word, if it really makes sense in that moment, okay? Don't try to force your essay full of, you know, big words if they don't require them. So, and same with sentence structures, some simple sentences, some compound, some complex, some compound complex, some question, a question form, it's up to you, but you know, a mix, but really focus on clarity. Um, Ganesh, do we have to wear a mask while doing the test? I believe so. Gee, uh, please check with your test provider though. 
Gene, for, for right essay, do we use past or present test for phrases like research studies reveal or research studies revealed? Um, it depends, Gene. Um, for example, if you're, use, if you're writing an, as an example in an essay, you would say research studies reveal. Um, if you're basing, doing a summarized written text and you can say research studies revealed. So the verb tense, it really depends on the context of what you're trying to say. And yeah, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a trick. I'd say go with your instinct, but yeah. I mean, can we use personal examples in the body paragraphs to support the main reason idea? Yes, you can. I would try to, you, you have to give an example for each paragraph. You're gonna write two paragraphs. So give maximum one personal one and then use one sort of impersonal example. Janatul, what have to do to find incorrect missing words? Just click on the words or click on the words and write the correct answer. What do you have to do to find the incorrect missing words? Just click on the words or click on the words and write the correct answer. I'm sorry, Janatul, what question are you referring to? I can't pick it up. Naomi, um, for writing the summary for listening, it is better to use synonyms instead of exact words from the audio? No, I would use exact words from the audio. Yeah. Um, just with, like, I mean, you're not going to be transcribing the exact lecture okay you're just going to be picking keywords keywords and so then when you write your summary you're including your own language in it so that's fine mingling social distance might help reduce the distraction from others not so close now oh yeah good one good point good point omid considering we have collective time for listening how much time should we spend on each of the fill in the blank questions so omid there's a there's a blog article you should read um, if you go to Google and type in PTE time management and look at the E2 language blog, I think it's the number one blog that comes up. What we've done is we've gone through every question in the PTE and given a, what we think is the, oh, sorry, for listening and reading, we've given um, suggested lengths of time you should spend on each question. And I think it's really accurate, actually. Richard. Last one for me, any tips for reorder paragraph? Uh, I'd really recommend all my tips, all our tips are in the uh, methods lesson. So please check out the methods lesson again. You know, you, it's really about meaning, subject, verb, object, um, information flowing from one sentence to the next in a coherent way, um, using grammar as hints, etc. Click on something which are incorrect. Still don't know which which are which question you're talking about, Janatul? Which are you talking about the essay? You're talking about reading and writing, fill in the blanks. Which one? Jean, when the questions mention discussed the discuss the extent you agree or disagree with the statement, do we have to choose one of the side only, or can we discuss both sides and conclude? So with with the essays, it's an argumentative essay. It's always argumentative. And so there'll be a two-sided argument. There'll always be some sort of social conflict, you know, cigarette smoking or taxes or something boring like that. But you have to pick a side, okay? There's going to be two sides to the argument. Make sure you, you really strongly pick a side. You can mention the other side of the argument, but only if you want to knock it down, okay? Some people believe that cigarette smoking is good. However, as far as I'm concerned, cigarette smoking is terrible, you know? So you might mention a, a, some argument that pe people might make, but stick to a side, argue a side. And if, if, it, if, it, if the question is, to what extent do you think cigarette smoking is bad? I strongly believe, you need an adverb. I strongly, I slightly believe, or that doesn't really make sense. Strong, just go strongly believe, honestly, make your life easier. You have to be a bit of a fascist in the essay. Don't think too, too much into detail about it. Just pick a side, the easiest side, and argue for that, and don't worry about it. Niharika, how to practice summarize written text. Yeah, so reading skills, write your sentence, feedback is critical. Mihanaz, how many mock tests can we avail in one year membership? Well, it depends how you think about it, because we've got um, hundreds of practice questions. 
We've got daily live classes where there's, uh, you know, mock tests every day, listening, reading, writing, speaking with the teacher, section-wise mock tests every day. I think there's about 13 or 14 weeks of those. Um, and then we've got the just the just the one scored uh, mock test, and I, we've only got one because it is assessed. All items get assessed. Sorry, all the speaking and writing items get assessed by an expert teacher from E2 Language, and it's to provide you very comprehensive feedback. But in other words, heaps of questions. Wendell, I guess she was referring about highlight incorrect words in listening. Oh, okay, good. Yes. Okay. Yes. For high, is it highlight incorrect words? Yes. Highlight incorrect words is the one where you listen to the lecture and you have to click on the words and they turn yellow. You click on the words that are incorrect or differ from what the speaker says. If you accidentally click one and you want to change it back to white, you just click it again. Genevieve, I'm having trouble in accessing e2school.com. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Thanks, Genevieve. I'll check that out. Omid, would it be okay to have the same structure for all described image questions? Yes, it's fine. It works, Omid. Same as retail lecture, same as summarized spoken text. Use the same structure. It's fine. Genital, yes, you just click it. If it goes yellow, you click it again, it goes white. Sakshi, so many, YouTube, so many YouTube videos say we should write both sides in the essay. I tried it in one exam and I also tried it not mentioning the other side in the other, but still did not get 79. Sakshi, it's... um. It might not be that. There's many elements that make up a, a good essay. So, um, um, you might want to. Yeah, I, I don't know if you've gotten any feedback yet, but really, the. I mean, it's like trying to diagnose a, a doctor diagnosing a patient without doing a, a physical examination. It's the same thing with language. We need to see your essay and identify what you're doing right or wrong. Um, it can be a bit tricky. Um, cool. All right. I think that's all. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube right now, please click the subscribe button and do yourself a favor and come across to e2language.com and sign up for free. And if you want to upgrade your account, you are more than welcome. Cool. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for coming along. I hope it was helpful. I'll see you soon.